Oh god. I... No. Professor, I left them. We have to go back. Shh. Calm yourself, Scott. You will. When you are recovered. Gone. All gone. I can't hear any of them. All silent but for Scott. He is the only one that has returned. My god. What have I done? What did I send them into? Jean. Warren. Bobby. Alex. Lorna. All missing. Maybe dead. Scott doesn't remember what happened. Doesn't know why he was the only one let go. Doesn't even remember how he got back onto the jet. I have no choice. I can't take the chance that they are still alive. I must pull up every mutant I have ever found. Find any suitable recruits. Any mutants that could help. I need to find all new X-Men. Finseldorf, Germany. Nestled deep in the Bavarian Alps, this tiny village has hardly changed over the centuries. In Winseldorf, life is peaceful, for nothing ever happens here to disturb the domestic tranquility. Until tonight. This way, man. The monster is this way. A mob runs down the street yelling, weapons both deadly and makeshift raised. It is like a scene from Frankenstein as Kurt Wagner tries to run from the baying mob, his thoughts erratic as he does. Monster is it? The fools! It is they who are the monsters. Them with their mindless prejudices. Perhaps this would have been safer if I had stayed with their Jahrmarkt. But I was done being their carnival freak. Let them come as they must. Let them try to kill me. At least if I die, then it will be as a man. The one once known in the circus as the incredible Nightcrawler now leaps with inhuman skill from the cobbled ground and onto an old stone and wood house, using his three-fingered and toed limbs to scurry onto its roof. We got him. Come down, monster. Come down or we will burn you down. Go away. Leave me alone. I have done nothing. But the response the cornered misfit receives is one he hardly expected. The villagers now throw their flaming torches onto the roof. The house set ablaze. They are utterly mad. They set for serious. They'll destroy this entire village to make certain they destroy me. And why? I came among them only to learn. Yet all I have learned thus far are ways of blind, unreasoning violence. Well, if that is all that those who live in the normal world have to teach me, then I will show them it is a lesson I have learned well. Kurt now leaps from the building like a cat. Then, tucking his chin, he rolls himself up into a ball and falls, bowling the crowd down as he does. 
but it does little to disperse them. The incensed mob now overwhelm the poor Kurt Wagner. Yeah, yeah. He cries out, trying to plunge through the mob until the sheer weight of their numbers carries him down. We have him! We have him! Quickly, bring the stick! Kurt cannot move his limbs, each part of him pulled and held still. He tries to thrash, but to no avail. His eyes wide as the usually peaceful townsfolk now bring forth the said stake. Stretching him out as they go to drive it into his heart, as though he were a vampire of legends. No! 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 Stop! Please, no! Now, monster. Now we will be rid of you. Now we will stop! A voice penetrates the air, and remarkably, they do. What? They are not moving. What happened to them? I happened to them, Kurt Wagner. Kurt stands, looking in amazement as a bald man in a wheelchair moves towards him. My name is Charles Xavier. You did this to them? But how? Why? I heard you say you had come here to learn. My friend, I am a teacher. I run a school for gifted youngsters like you. A school for mutants. Mutant? Yeah, I have heard the word. You are a mutant, Kurt. And I can help you find your true potential. Can you help me be normal? After tonight, do you truly want to be? Perhaps not. I want only to be Kurt Wagner. If you can make me that, teacher, I will go with you. Quebec, Canada. Few people know of this secluded military installation. Fewer still know its true purpose. It is the home base of a very special government agency and its very special military agent, the agent codenamed Weapon X. They're waiting for you in the conference room, sir. Let them wait. <sighs> I guess I'd better see what they want. The door of the conference room is slammed open. Behind it stands a man in a very different kind of military uniform. All right, gents, I'm here. Now who's this bigwig you want me to meet? I am the bigwig, Wolverine. Professor Charles Xavier, at your service. Am I supposed to be impressed? Top brass is impressed, Wolverine. All I know is that the professor is here to make you some sort of offer. An offer, eh? Okay, Prof. You've piqued my curiosity. What's the deal? Straight to the point, then. I know of your recent missions and battles with very powerful men, Wolverine. Moreover, I know of your powers. You, my friend, are a mutant, and I am in need of mutants. Desperate need. What about my position here? I'm offering you a chance to become a free agent. A chance to learn to put your gifts to their greatest use. Chance to get out from under the red tape and the rigmarole, eh? All right, Professor. You found your man. The man known as Wolverine extends his hand and shakes Xavier's. What? Not so fast, fella. This government has invested a great deal of time and money turning you into what you are now. You try working out, and I'll have you locked up. Uh-huh. Seems you didn't get my meaning, bub. This is still a free country, ain't it? The officer reels in fear as from the Wolverine's gloved hand emerges three straight metal knife claws. He now walks over and reaches his clawed hand up and then brings it down, slicing the officer's tie clean in two. <gasps> so I'm resigning my commission, effective immediately. Wolverine now leans in, backing the suited man into the wall and pressing his claws now up to his quivering chin. Unless you have any further objections, no? Didn't think so. Wolverine now retracts his metal claws back into the hand from where they came. He turns and follows the professor out of the room. The officer, now suddenly feeling brave, folds his arms. Believe me, mister. You haven't heard the last of this. Anytime you want me, you know where to come looking. Come on, prof. Let's go. And while on a flight to Africa, 
Xavier finds himself confirming another team member. You said if ever I needed you, you would be there. I need you, Sean. Aye, all right. Let me just settle things here and I'll meet you back at your school. How long do you think you'll be? A week, at least. I have a few more stops around the world before going home. Kenya, East Africa. Atop a lonely knoll there, up massive ancient stone steps, is a giant monument, once used for ancient worship, and now used to worship a living god. Men come to it with humility, their voices raised in praise and song, prayerful supplication. Ororo, great goddess of the storm, come unto us and ease our burden. And with the hollow crash of thunder and the moan of the lonely winds, the goddess Storm comes. I am here, my children. What do you wish of me? A woman now stands under the stone arch, naked but for a loincloth, gold bracelet-covered arms raised to the sky, a black headdress pushing back her wild, pure white hair from her dark skin, her blue, crystal-like eyes sparkling as she speaks. There is a drought upon the lands, blessed one. Our crops wither, our grasses parch. Ten goats and chickens will we slay in your honor. If you only bring us rain. Save your beasts, my children. You have more need of them than I. I will do as you plead. Her eyes change, her pupils disappearing entirely. And, as her eyes grow dark, the sky does as well. Once more, the winds howl and come up, sweeping the storm goddess away. She soars onto them, into the sky, riding them like an ebony bird, lightning lancing from her fingertips, the glow of life shining full upon her face. She loves to be here, only truly happy among the elements. And then, the raging sky, touched by her happiness, weeps. When she returns to Earth at last, her joy is shared by all. Amazing goddess! Truly beautiful! Thank you! Aurora smiles as she looks down upon her grateful, cheering worshippers, then turns as Charles Xavier appears from beside her, as if from thin air. Who? Who are you? What business do you have in Aurora's land? My name is Charles Xavier. And I have come to make you an offer I pray you do not refuse. An offer? What have you to offer a goddess? Indeed. You have a land, Aurora. And people who worship you. Who adore you. I offer you a world where people may fear and hate you. But people who need you nonetheless. The world I offer may not be beautiful. But it is real. Far more real than the fantasy you are living now. You are no goddess, Aurora. You are a mutant. And you have responsibilities. Come with me, child. Taste the world outside. You may find its flavor bitter. Or surprisingly sweet. You present a most peculiar argument. Yet, I sense deep sincerity in your words. All right, I will come with you. Perhaps the time has come for me to leave the nest at last. Osaka, Japan. Two old acquaintances share tea in the splendid garden of Shiro Yoshida. I know your feelings towards the Western world, Shiro. I would not have come to you. But you require help that only I may give. So... I owe you nothing, Professor, but perhaps I owe something to myself. Perhaps it is time for the world to once again hear from Sunfire. Lake Baikal, Siberia. It has been a good year for the collective farm. The crop has been larger than expected. The wheat fills the fields like an amber sea. And those that toil in the fields are filled with a feeling of satisfaction, the knowledge of a job well done. But. For Peter Rasputin, 
that feeling is soon overwhelmed by fear. As he works away on the wheat, Peter hears and feels the rumble of an engine, the engine of a combine harvester that pulls up beside him, the man driving it, calling out and pointing off in the distance. Piotro, your sister! What? No, Ilyana! The young man looks up from his work. His eyes grow wide with horror. He discerns it all in an instant, a runaway tractor speeding towards his little sister playing blindly in its path. And without hesitation, the huge, hulking young man takes off, running for his child sister, legs pumping, heart pounding. And then, with no effort at all, his skin suddenly changes to that of solid line steel metal. The armored machine bears relentlessly down on the unwitting child as an armored colossus snatches her from its path. But there is no time for Peter Rasputin to move out of harm's way. Thus, he stands his ground as the rampant tractor plunges towards him. He wonders how his poor neighbors will ever afford a new one. That, though, is a worry for another day. This day will be filled with enough problems, as Pietro stands cradling his little sister, looking over the wreckage of the tractor machine. A voice suddenly enters his head. Peter Rasputin, I wish to talk to you. Who? By now we know the answer to that question. So, moments later... You want me to go with you to America? Forgive me, Professor, but if I possess such power as you say... Should it not be used for the good of my own state? Such power as yours belongs to the world, Peter. To be used for the good of all. And believe me, your powers are needed. Then come, we will talk to my parents. Almost an hour later. This professor wants me to go with him. To teach me how to deal with my... My mutant powers. There is wisdom in his words, Papa. But I am happy here. Tell me, Papa, what should I do? Do as your heart tells you, my son. It will not betray you. My heart tells me to stay, Papa. But my conscience tells me otherwise. I must go, Papa. The young man pulls his mother into a tearful embrace. And minutes later... Peter is following Xavier away from his house and his homeland. Dosvidanya, Peter. Our love goes with you. Do not worry, Mama. I will write you. Goodbye, Papa. I will make you proud. We are already proud of you, my son. Camp Verde, Arizona. John Proudstar does not like the reservation. He does not like to watch the old ones sitting slumped against their doorsteps, dreaming dreams of glory long gone. John Proudstar is an Apache, and he is ashamed of his people. The Apache were meant to be hunters, warriors, not sad-eyed, simpering squaws. They were meant to run free through the crisp plains grasses, the wind blowing wildly through their hair. He does so now, running side by side at an amazing speed with a bison, running right up to it so as to grab its horns and then use them to drive it down into the ground head first. In the old days, the bison would fall like rain before Apache skill, Apache bravery. But no bison ever fell like this. As the bison now lies still, beaten, John Proudstar rises up in pride over it, his thoughts very loud and clear in his mind. There you see, Horned One. There is still a man amongst the Apache. And it is such a man I have come looking for, John Proudstar. Proudstar turns with a start, seeing the wheelchair-bound Xavier before him. Huh? How the hell did a cripple get all the way out here? Wait, I don't care. You have five seconds to get out of my sight. I don't want company, especially yours. Are you sure about that, my young friend? I have come to help you fulfill your dream, to help you bring pride back to your people. You are special, John Proudstar, a mutant, and you are needed. Pfft, the white man needs me. Too bad. 
I owe your kind nothing but the grief that you've all given my people. Now get lost. Proudstar turns and begins to walk away from Xavier. I offer you a chance to help the world and you turn your back on me. Then I guess what they say is true. Perhaps the Apache are all frightened and selfish children. All right, that does it. Nobody calls me a coward, mister. I'm as good as the next guy. Hell, I'm better. Give me a chance and I'll prove it. You will have your chance. I promise you that. Westchester, New York. The school seemed like a later-day Tower of Babel at first, but a telepathic crash course in English has closed the communication gap in mere minutes. Now, Professor Charles Xavier sits, somberly studying his new houseguests, all attired in outfits and disguises they had either brought with them or been given by Xavier himself. And whatever thoughts he may have at this point remain his own. I have never seen clothing like this. The costume is beautiful. The cape is a wonderful touch and a perfect fit. But how did you... The uniforms are constructed from unstable molecules, which adjust themselves wherever where necessary. I got them from a friend of mine who is no longer with us. But now... Now you tell us why you dragged us here, Professor. I, for one, am swiftly losing my patience. Sunfire, please. It was not my intention to waste your time. I was merely awaiting the arrival of someone who can better explain the situation. My friends, allow me to introduce Scott Summers. You may better know him in the media as the X-Man Cyclops. He will fill you in with the details. The group looks up as the door opens and Scott Summers walks into the lobby. The details are very simple, people. You have been called here because the X-Men have disappeared, and you seven are the only hope of getting them back. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Follow me, I'll explain on the way. Cyclops leads the group through the building and to the lower levels, where the Cerebro unit resides. This is Cerebro. It's a mutant detection unit. This is how the professor found all of you. And how we lost my closest friends. Almost a week ago, we picked up the strongest mutant signature we'd ever received. It was coming from the island of Krakoa in the South Pacific. We decided to investigate and find that mutant before anyone else did. Or anyone else got hurt. Within moments of landing, we were attacked. The trees, the grass, the very island itself seemed to attack us and... I... I don't remember anything after that. I blacked out and woke up on board our Blackbird jet, heading back here to the school. The controls were locked and on autopilot. I couldn't do anything. I tried for hours to go back. <sighs> Nothing worked. When I landed... When he landed, I saw that Scott was the only one left. The only one I could still feel through our psychic bond. So they're dead? No. No, I won't believe that. Something happened. I was sent back for a reason. They're alive. I know it. Calm down, Scott. Sorry. My brother and girlfriend are with them. You have no idea how hard it was to wait here for days as the professor tracked all of you down. I also noticed that Scott wasn't wearing his visor. His visor that stops his optic blasts. We thought he had lost his powers in the battle. And they came back, stronger than ever. Luckily, I managed to modify one of his old visors to contain the increased power. Then he left me here to retrain while he went and found all of you. And he found us. So now what? Now we go back to Karkoa. We go get my team and stop whatever it was that defeated us. You are wrong, Cyclops. You all are going back to Karkoa, but not me. I will have no part of this fool's errand. What? This is a chance for you to help, Sunfire, to help your fellow mutants. I do not even like my fellow mutants, Cyclops. And I will certainly not risk my life to help them. Then why did you bother coming? Because I thought I was needed for something important. Not the token Asian on a rescue mission for the dead. Why, you... No. No. Fine, Sunfire. I won't waste time arguing. If you want to go, then go. The rest of us have a job to do. The Blackbird jet streaks skyward, and there is only one empty seat on board. It seems I've had my first taste of mutant camaraderie, and 
I must say, Cyclops, that I did not like it. Maybe you didn't notice, sister, but this group ain't exactly a mutant admiration society. We're all involved in this for our own reasons, girly. And patting each other on the back ain't one of the... Huh? Hey, One-Eye! There's someone tailing us! The group look up out of the cockpit windows, seeing the streaking form of Sunfire blazing into their flight path. Well, I'll be... Oh, are you going to open the hatch, Cyclops? Do you expect me to fly all the way to Kakoa myself? Moments later, inside the jet. So the prodigal mutant returns. What made you change your mind, Sunfire? Afraid to go home alone? <laughs> my reasons are no one's business but my own, misfit. You do well to remember that. Hours pass with little chatter until finally the forsaken atoll called Krakoa looms full before the viewports. So that's where you mislaid your partners, huh? Can't say much for your taste in vacation spots, Summers. And I can't say I care for your sense of humor, Wolverine. Nor yours, Thunderbird. The name's Proud Star, One-Eye. Not anymore. The professor has given you all code names, group. So you might as well start getting used to them. Now, the assault teams will be as follows. Storm. You and Colossus will be our team from the north. Banshee and Wolverine will move across from the east. It's a pleasure to be working with you, laddie. Whoopee. Sunfire and Nightcrawler, you'll start searching from the south. No, not him. I did not hear Cyclops giving you a choice, my friend. Thunderbird and I will handle the west end of the island. Now get ready, south team. Your drop is coming up. I don't much like your tone of voice, Cyclops. And I don't much like you, Sunfire. Now go! The hatch opens, and from it, Sunfire blazes through the sky. Using his blazing fires like his namesake to defy gravity, holding on to Nightcrawler and lowering them both down to Earth. East Team, you're up. From the same hatch, Banshee does the same, screeching his sonic scream and using its waves to levitate him and his yellow clad passenger to the ground. Right! Do you have to screech like that? North team. That's our signal. Colossus says, leaping down through the Bombay doors. Colossus, no! Storm leaps out after him, using the winds to fly down to reach him, grabbing him. You can't fly, you fool! No, but I can land with the best of them, my dear. Back on the plane. The chick and the rusky have landed, and it looks like they're arguing, which is about on par with this outfit. We're next, Thunderbird. Strap in. Once more, the Blackbird's vertical landing thrusters kick in, lowering the stealth plane to the mysterious island. And though he tries, the man called Cyclops cannot help but shudder. How many will he lose this time, he wonders. Will he even live long enough to find out? Though he is experienced, battle-tested and professional, he questions, and the terror of discovering the worst for his nearest and dearest follows him as he exits the jet onto the grassy earth. However, he decides to leave his fear on the ship. This way, Thunderbird. The sooner we start, the sooner we get there. Yes, General One-Eye, sir. Must be my luck to be the first Native American to be- Hold it. I left the- I don't believe it. What? They turn around, seeing the jet they just exited moments ago, gone. The Blackbird, it's gone. But the ground doesn't simply open up and swallow a jet whole. Yeah, and strange temples don't suddenly spring up out of nowhere either. Huh? That joint wasn't here when we landed. Thunderbird exclaims as beyond the forest now towers the huge stone form of an ancient looking temple. Seems as good a spot as any to start looking. Come on. Grumbling in annoyance, the mutant now reluctantly called Thunderbird follows his Cyclopean companion into the very deep underbrush. John Proudstar has never much liked the jungle. What the? Ah! 
and apparently the feeling is mutual. The vines of the trees around them moving in and wrapping around both he and Cyclops, grabbing them, pulling them. The vines are alive! And we won't be unless we do something fast. John grabs the vines, using his natural strength to power out and lift one over his head. Any suggestions, One-Eye? Scott blasts one of his capturing vines in two. Not really. For a beginner, you're doing pretty well on your own. Before long, the two young mutants leave the struggling vines behind and head towards their destination. Meanwhile, on the other side of the underbrush. Whatever you say, Ororo, you are so unlike the girls in my... What is that sound? The two run for their lives as around them rocks fall from the above cliff face and smash all around them. Run, Peter. Perhaps we can... Boy, boy. No. This landslide cannot be outrun or all. It has changed direction to follow us. Then we must stand our ground and defend ourselves. The wing howls and forms around the hands of the rider, pushing back against the rocks and deflecting as many as her wind can carry. <laughs> Meanwhile, Colossus now grabs a tree from the ground, heaving it up and turning it to swing it at the boulders. Get behind me, Aurora. These rocks cannot harm me. Peter smashes the rocks away with ease, as behind him, Storm turns up the gain. I thank you, Peter, but I am in no need of your protection. With that, she sends the rocks flying into the air and down off the coastline and into the ocean. Moments later, they join up with two of their companions at the strange temple. We made it. And just about in one piece. Who? Storm. Colossus. On the island's east side, the Wolverine and Banshee look with amazement into the water as giant crabs the size of dinner tables emerge from the lapping waves. Scene, Sladdy! Well, you look at the size of them beasties. Looks like the local welcoming committee, Irish. Guess I'd better say hi. Good thing they ain't the only ones with claws. You gonna stand there gawking, Irish, or you gonna help me? But the Irish-born mutant is already aloft, his sonic scream nowhere near as flamboyant as his companion's talons, but no less effective. <laughs> The battle is violent, but brief. Well, laddie, that's that. We'd better be getting back to that temple we spotted a touchback. Right behind you, Irish. Minutes later. Thank the good lord. Tis good to see you all in one piece. Now just for sunfire and night. The very birds attacked us. This mission is more than I signed up for. I have a feeling that someone or something lured us here deliberately, and I'd hate to disappoint them now. Ugh. Damn it. Door sealed tight, and about a foot thick. Storm, Colossus, Sunfire, if you would... The stone doorway is shattered inward as the fist of Colossus, the fires of Sunfire, and the winds of Storm make a makeshift entrance. Cautiously, they step into the darkness. Now what's in here that's so... Oh my god and find their hearts swelling heavy in their throats. It's Jean, Alex, the other X-Men. The group look up as around them the original X-Men are all strung up by vices, almost looking like tentacles as they pierce the skin of the out-cold mutants. These things, they are feeding on them. Well, don't just stand there. Help me get them free. With a few blasts, the team cut the X-Men loose, Scott now lowering Jean into his arms, still not moving. Jean. Jean. Quickly, all of you, carry whoever is closest to you. We're getting out of here before this temple comes down on top of us.
and even as the arcane temple crashes into ruin behind them. Oh, thank God. They're coming round. Scott? Scott, no! You have to go! Now! What? I had to... I couldn't leave you to die. It wanted you to come back. It let you go so you could find more. More mutants for it to feed on. Warren, for what to feed on? Don't you get it? We came to the island looking for a mutant. Scott! Krakoa is the mutant! The group look up in terror and disbelief as the ground now forms into a creature. The forest, the ground, the earth they were standing on becoming a giant monstrous form. And, as they do, images are beamed into their minds, images of nuclear tests just south of this position. How it affected the island, changed it, made it a mutant, made it sentient, one living form from many, one being, Krakoa, the living island. But its hunger went appeased until the X-Men arrived. Krakoa fed upon their mutant energies and grew hungrier still, and so it released one X-Man, letting him have no memory of the incident and sending him back to find more, knowing that his feelings for them would bring him back here with yet more mutants to feast upon. It... it used me. The group then see red in their minds as the formed creature brings down what could almost be an arm. <laughs> smashing into the ground on which they stand. The group scattering as the floor beneath them. The entire landscape fights against them, trying to trap them. Yeah. Guys, get back! You are gonna run, or you're gonna fight. Who the hell are you? Name's Wolverine, kid. Now stand back and watch me work. Hey, ugly! You may be mighty big, but I'm betting you bleed like the rest of us. Let's find out. <laughs> Wolverine climbs up the form's arm, slashing and cutting as the beast cries out in what could almost be pain. What takes place next cannot be described, as every one of the numerous X-Men give their all, sending everything they have at the creature until... Scott, stop! You're going about this all wrong. Huh? Professor? I have been monitoring you on Cerebro, watching the battle studying the creature. And I believe I have found a weakness. Listen carefully. In an instant, Professor Charles Xavier's mental commands are projected halfway across the world. Then, he closes his eyes, preparing himself for the coming ordeal. He concentrates, joining the battle. It is a battle fought on two fronts, as Professor X wages deadly mental combat with the crazed community intellect, stalling it while his students hurry to carry out his plan. Now, Storm. At his command, Storm takes to the sky. Her eyes grow dark once more, and she soars aloft on the wings of the wind. High above Krakoa, she hovers, then slowly summons to her the Tempest's full electric fury, sending her lightning down into Lorna Dane. Polaris, transmitting the magnetic energies into a massive wave of her power. Within moments, the circuit is complete. Ah! Lorna screams in anguish as her physical limits are reached and exceeded. Don't stop! Whatever you do, don't stop! Scott, you have to call it off. Lorna can't take it. She'll be killed. I can't, Alex. I can't sacrifice all of us for one person, even if it is the woman you love. Scott, if she dies... The remainder of Havoc's angry outburst is slain by the crackling roar of the thunderous downpour, even as the torrential waters lend life to something else. What are they doing? The bloody things are getting stronger. Scott, I can't... The mind of the being has grown more powerful. I... I... I can't... Professor? Professor? We can't hold that thing off forever, Scott, if the Professor's plan doesn't work. We'll know soon enough, Jean. Everyone get back. With that, a 
solemn Scott Summers turns to find that the figure of Lorna Dane has become lost within a coruscating incandescent tower of sheer magnetic force. His eyes grow narrow, and then a single word forms upon his lips. Now! He and Havoc let loose with all they have, and, with an almost indescribable force, Lorna's magnetic energies erupt downward through five miles of ocean, through 4,000 miles of the Earth's ancient crust, down to the very molten core of the planet itself. Holy sh... The island's breaking up around us! Without the Blackbird, how are we going to... Leave it to me, bird boy. Across the beach, a piece of ocean now freezes into a level ice platform. Everyone, get on! Now! Swiftly and desperately, the X-Men clamber aboard the crude ice craft. Then, hang on for dear life as the mutant powers of Cyclops and Havoc propel the makeshift vessel away. Away from Krakoa with the speed of a hurtling hydroplane. Behind them, the world convulses in carnage as the results of Lorna Dane's energy bolt become apparent at last. For her electricity charges burst had cut across the planet's primary lines of magnetic force, severing them. And, for an instant, about the island of Krakoa, gravity ceased to exist. Then, the Earth forces came violently together and the effects are the same as squeezing wet soap through a fist. The island's death cries ring for long seconds in the minds of the awestruck X-Men as the island travels into the sky and then into the empty vacuum of space. Then, a new, more frightening reality intrudes upon the scene. Brace yourselves! Oh God, a whirlpool! The world is rushing to fill the whole Krakoa left. And we're being sucked right into it! Bobby, Storm, see what you can do. Right! The Iceman then sends a freezing blast ahead of them, shielding the platform in a watertight dome of snow as behind him, Storm moves her hands and does all she can to calm the winds and the currents. And then, all is quiet. As they emerge from their dome, the team then look over as their stealth jet emerges from the ocean, in which it sank. The plane! Forgot that Hank built the thing to be watertight. Everyone climb in. Moments later, as the recovered blackbird streaks skyward. Sorry, we don't have seats for you all. But this plane wasn't exactly designed to carry so many mutants. Which brings us on to our next problem. What are we going to do with 13 X-Men?